mean, Madam Speaker, I've worked closely with my colleagues in the pro-choice caucus to identify stories that need to be told during this special hour this evening. And I am grateful to my colleagues who have taken to the floor this evening to share with us the stories of their constituents, to share with us the stories of those that they know have been fighters for reproductive rights, for reproductive justice, for choice. One of our pro-choice caucus leaders um, could not be with us tonight, but has submitted a statement uh, for the record that I would like to read now from Representative Judy Chu. I rise today to honor the women of the abortion rights movement who have come before us. I remember what it was like before the days of Roe, and so today I am helping to remember and honor those who gave their lives who put their own bodies in harm's way so that we might have the ability to decide what to do with ours. Women like Pam, who lives in my district in Pasadena, California. Pam is in her 70s, retired, and spends her time volunteering in her community. But Pam told me about a time when she was 22 years old. It was 1969, and even though she and her partner had been using birth control, Pam found out she was pregnant. This happened in the days before Roe v. Wade, which meant that her options were limited. That's how Pam found herself standing on the curb of an airport in Mexico City, waiting for someone to pick her up. Finally, a large black car came up and rolled down the window. Are you Pam? The driver asked. Yes, she replied, and got in the car, forced to trust and hope for the best. Thankfully, Pam wasn't hurt during this experience, but she told me she's never forgotten the fear and uncertainty of putting her life in the hands of a stranger who could have hurt her and abused her, especially when we know that this is a procedure that is safe and can be done in a doctor's office, not someplace unknown and unsafe. That is why now, Pam is determined to ensure that no one ever feels as scared and alone as she did that day. Pam volunteers at the Planned Parenthood Pasadena and San Gabriel Valley, serving as a support system to women who need a hand to hold or a shoulder to lean on. Pam is an abortion advocate in her community because she believes, like I do, that everyone, no matter where they grew up, what language they speak, or how much money they make, deserves to have a say in what happens to their bodies. I rise today as part of Women's History Month to honor Pam and so many others like her who were forced to make history so that others could have the choices that they were denied. The fight for reproductive rights would not be where it is today without advocates like Pam who stand up time and time again and demand that women have the right to decide. Madam Speaker, this evening, the Pro-Choice Caucus and I also want to recognize the women who launched and built the groundbreaking reproductive justice movement. While women of color have long fought for these principles, reproductive justice as a term was coined in 1994 when a group of black women gathered in Chicago ahead of the International Conference on Population and Development in Cairo. Loretta Ross is one of a number of women who built the reproductive justice movement. She was part of the 1994 meeting and went on to co-found the organization Sister Song, which defines reproductive justice as the human right to maintain personal bodily autonomy, have children, not have children, and parent the children we have in a safe and sustainable communities. A scholar who teaches both at Smith College and has published extensively on reproductive justice, she recently testified before the House Committee on Oversight and Government Reform in this legislative session. Dorothy Roberts is another pioneer of the reproductive justice movement. 
from Pennsylvania. She is also considered one of the leaders. And there have been many leaders in our government, in our communities that we celebrate tonight. We in the Pro-Choice Caucus have identified a few women that we want to highlight this evening. And I will start with some of the lawmakers and legislators who helped pave the way, including Shirley Chisholm, the first black woman elected to Congress in 1968. She was also the first black woman to run for president. And throughout her trailblazing career, she was a strong supporter for reproductive rights. In 1969, she was named honorary president of the National Abortion Rights Action League, NARAL. And in 1970, she supported legalized abortion in her home state of New York. And in 1970, described abortion as an issue of economic and racial justice. Louise Slaughter, a longtime member from New York and chairwoman of the Rules Committee, Louise Slaughter was a steadfast supporter of reproductive rights during her long tenure in Congress, serving as a founder and co-chair of the Pro-Choice Caucus. In addition to championing legislation to protect and expand access to abortion and contraception, Rep. Slaughter condemned efforts to expand the so-called conscience protections at the expense of healthcare access and was an early leader on marriage equality. First elected in 1972, Pat Schroeder was one of only 14 women in the House at the time of the January 1973 Roe v. Wade decision. When a male colleague asked her how she could be a mother of two small children and a member of Congress at the same time, she famously replied, I have a brain and a uterus and I use both. Other, other figures um, that are large in the women's and reproductive rights movement, of course, must include Ellen Malcolm, uh, who in 1985 led a group of friends in creating an organization dedicated to electing pro-choice Democratic women, giving them the credibility and resources that they needed through her organization, Emily's List. Of course, we began this evening talking about Sarah Weddington, and there are many lawyers and judges who have been a part of this movement at some time in their careers, including famously, of course, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Catherine Colbert, Priscilla Smith, Linda Coffey. Of course, we heard from several people tonight, several of our members, about the work done in their local communities at Planned Parenthood health centers across the country. And as we touch on some of these important women leaders in our community, in our country, we certainly recognize the leadership that we have seen at Planned Parenthood health centers, including Faye Waddleton, who was the first black woman to serve as the president of Planned Parenthood Federation of America, as well as the youngest. Cecile Richards, who was the president of Planned Parenthood Federation of America and the Planned Parenthood Action Fund for more than a decade and is the daughter of the late Texas governor, another champion for reproductive rights, women's rights and women's equality, Ann Richards. Alexis McGill Johnson, the current president and CEO of Planned Parenthood Federation of America and the Planned Parenthood Action Fund, is in charge and oversees Planned Parenthood's vital health services to 2.4 million people each year through more than 600 health centers across the country. She is a champion for social and racial justice, a respected political and cultural organizer, and a tireless advocate for reproductive freedom. The National Abortion Rights Action League, NARAL, which I mentioned earlier, has always had uh, an incredible role to play in the fight for reproductive rights, and its leaders, Karen Mulhauser, Nanette Falkenberg, Kate Michaelman, Nancy Keenan, Elise Hogue, and today, Mini Timaraju, uh, have, have left an incredible mark. Um, also, the Guttmacher Institute, in its current leadership under Dr. Herminia Palacio. Uh, the Guttmacher Institute's mission is to advance sexual and reproductive health and rights in the United States and across the globe. There are so many people, so many women, who have come together around these issues, who've come together to protect the health, the equality, the autonomy, and the dignity of women across this country. And those are the people, whether named or not this evening on the floor,
Those are the people that we celebrate tonight. Madam Speaker, we began this hour with a celebration of trailblazing, fearless women from my home state of Texas. And I'm so grateful to my colleagues from Texas who joined me this evening and to my colleagues from across the country who speak out tonight. Today in Texas and across the country, reproductive rights are under attack. The passage of the draconian Senate Bill 8 in Texas, which Representative Stevens discussed, which Representative V.C. discussed, this bill has created a health care crisis for women and health care providers across our state. And sadly, sadly, but not surprisingly, other states are quickly following suit. And as we have seen and as we have heard from some of our colleagues this evening, it's not merely abortion, but advocates with cases pending before the United States Supreme Court today, including Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization, are arguing that the protections recognized in Roe v. Wade, in Griswold versus Connecticut, which gave married couples the right to use birth control, that those principles should be rejected. This is alarming. This is terrifying. This is not what the majority of Americans want, and it is not what people have fought so hard for so long to achieve. And that is why it's so important that this evening we remember and honor the work that people have done to ensure reproductive rights, reproductive health, and reproductive justice. And it is also important that we recommit ourselves to continuing that work. As my colleagues noted in September, thanks to the leadership of Representative Judy Chu and the Pro-Choice Caucus, the House passed the Women's Health Protection Act to protect the right to access abortion care against restrictions and bans in every state in our union. Passing this legislation is a critical step toward creating a world where every person, whoever they are, wherever they live, whatever their circumstances, is free to make the best health care and personal decisions for themselves, their families, and their futures. And we must continue to defend and protect the fundamental rights essential to our autonomy, our dignity, and our equality that are represented in the case of Roe v. Wade and the Women's Health Protection Act. And so in times like these, it's important to me to remember, and it's important for all of us to remember, that Texas gave us SB 8, but it also gave us Sarah Weddington and Loretta Ross and Cecile Richards and so many other of the people that we talked about this evening and that we know have been champions for women's health, women's reproductive rights, and reproductive justice. Like women across the country, from New Hampshire to North Carolina to Florida to Michigan to California, all of whom spoke this evening, Texas women have fought and will continue to fight for the right to safe, legal, accessible abortion care, to reproductive health care, and to reproductive justice. I am proud to be one of them. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I yield back.